Okay. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, first off, my favorite thing, I uh, just want to recognize, especially with so many folks in the room today, our fire exits. So if you look to my left and to my right, there are fire exits. There are also exits in the back. So in any case of a fire, please file out carefully. Second, um, I need an approval of the agenda. Brian? Marty, all in favor? Aye. So there's six. Oh. And I uh, thank everyone for coming a little early today. Um, I know that we did want to recognize quite a few students, so we're excited to get started. Um, and with our first uh, thing, we're going to go ahead and hear from our art department and recognize students um, who have received a variety of art recognitions. And it's not. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, my name is Alyssa Dietrich. Chris Sequera. And we are um, part of the art department here in Fairport. And we'd like to recognize our talented artists for their participation in um, a number of our shows that we had this year. So first, um, sure. Okay. Uh, first, we'd like to recognize the students at, who participated in the RIT College of Art and Designs um, Start Here exhibit. And this is an exhibit that features artwork from students from all over the Finger Lakes. And uh, the teachers here are only allowed to select two works of art for, um, to represent you know, part, of, part of the program. So our first recognition is from Ava Dunham, who did a Raku Sheep. And her teacher is John Bryan. I'm not sure if all of our students are here today, but we don't think I'm here. Yeah, if you're. If you, are here. if you are here, <laughs> come on down and uh, and we have a, a certificate. Our next up is Gracelyn Slaughter, who did a Raku octopus. Again, her teacher is John Bryan. Oh, Gracelyn is here. Okay. Uh, Nicole Champlin, always another. That was a watercolor uh, self-portrait. And Nicole also received the LeVon Shepard Watercolor Award. Congratulations. And Raina Barpatre for her mixed media self portrait. Uh, Francesca Stanberry Bale, whose teacher is Lori Warnett, for her Swan's Pride, which is a silver ring, silver cast ring. Charlize Osborne for Me and Myself, another portrait done with Lori Warnett and artist Rhonda Allen. Part of our artist in residence program. Uh, Sam Shaw with Alcazar, that teacher is myself. Madison Hansen, Maddie with Bob and Ramen. Uh, Lorelai Color, uh, Aikigai, uh, my sole reason for being, more ramen. <laughs> 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 
Our next um, art show was Shared Spaces, which was at Nazareth College. And this is an exhibit where um, alumni and former art teachers that went to Nazareth College get to choose a student to participate with. Um, and it's Shared Spaces because we're sharing the spaces. We each do a piece with our student. Um, you can go ahead. And uh, John Bryan and Francesca Stanberry Bale. I'd like to recognize them for their clay pieces. Congratulations. And I exhibited with my daughter, Marina, who's at work tonight. So I'm representing her. <laughs> and then um, we just recently, I have to go pick up the uh, photos from Image City Art Gallery downtown on University Ave had our photography exhibit, um, again, uh, area, I think 16 area high schools were there to exhibit. Our first is Maya Allen, who, um, this is her photograph, Budapest. Maya could not make it tonight. Do a round of applause. Okay. Maribel Cardona for her pizza night. I don't know if Maribel is Maribel here? Okay. Yes. Riley Bodell for a scaly smile. Maggie Gigi for a rainy day. Tyler Hancock for pollination. Tyler also couldn't make it tonight. He had a Maggie O'Brien for Inner Harbor. Mary Kate Rudnicki for Get Out of My Head. Annabelle Rulo for Chimney Bluffs. And Delaney Yusko, who had two pieces in um, Golden Afternoon and she had two pieces. And Resilient Heart and Delaney also could not make it this evening. But. A great it was a great exhibit and that work will be coming back here and um, in our display cases here. Uh, next, and I think our final, is uh, the PTA Reflections. Uh, okay. <laughs> Maya Biedenbach for Sunny Days. These students were, um, this was all volunteer um, choosing to participate in this competition. And students could participate in a number of different themes, not just the arts, but um, photography. It could be filmmaking, music composition, performance, dance choreography. Um, and, and literature. So uh, Maya submitted this photo. Maya's sick tonight. <laughs> Layla Polino submitted the Majestic Goat, which was a colored pencil. And again, Eva Dunham for Sleepy Head. And West no. Finger for Death in the Dust. Uh, here we go. Uh, Emmeline, Emmeline, <laughs> old Zacher, every time. Uh, fish out of water. Uh, Emmeline's piece also won regionally and then went on to the state level. Uh, also, same with Madison Hansen, The Hate You Give, also won.
is is I think I think that that wraps up our presentation. Let's give our artists that are amazing. <laughs> And now we'll have recognition of our winter scholar athletes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Each sports season, our State Athletic Association will honor teams and individuals that excel in the classroom. 75% um, of rostered student athletes must have a GPA of 90% or greater in order for teams to qualify. Our first team to be recognized is Bo Boys Alpine and Nordic. I would like to recognize our state qualifiers, Ryan Kane, Braden Paoni, and Mike Stevens, and the rest of our student athletes. The Alpine and Nordic ski team had a 93.95 overall GPA. Congratulations to those student athletes. <laughs> Next up for girls, Alpine and Nordic. Um, I would like to give out a special recognition to Emily Kane and Sophia Maimon, who also did qualify for the state championships and overall as a team, their GPA was a 92.67. Next up for boys basketball, we had a uh, special recognition of Zach Ditzel and Wallace Raymond, who were named all to the Ella County. I would like to point out that Wallace received a Section 5 Sportsmanship Award for his participation this season and how he conducted himself. He was one of two throughout Section 5 that were recognized this season. The team was also Section 5 finalists in AA, and they lost the eventual state champions. And as a team, they were a 94.23 GPA. Congratulations to them. <laughs> Next up with girls basketball, I'd like to recognize all of our student athletes that received postseason recognition. Um, a special recognition to our Ronald McDonald All-Star players and Ella Maybon and Bella Pucci. Um, also, uh, Bella received first team All Greater Rochester. They were state ranked in AA, number 18th, and they were Section 5 AA semifinalists, losing to the eventual state champions in overtime. And as a team, they were 92.27 GPA. Congratulations to them. Next up for boys bowling, I'd um, like to recognize Braden Maskley and Aaron Maroney. They were members of the New York State Composite Team. That means during sectionals, they achieved a certain score, and they were able to represent the Section 5 team at the state championships, and they finished as a team with a GPA of 93.36. Congratulations to them. Next up is our girls bowling team, and they were Section 5 Class A champions and also competed at the New York State Team Championships. And as a team, they had a GPA of 91.43. Congratulations to them. <laughs> Next up for our winter competitive cheerleading team, I'd like to point out of the wonderful performances they had at the Arcadia Invitational and Victor Invitational. We also had student athletes that received postseason recognition. And as a team, they had a GPA of 92.75. Congratulations to them. <laughs> Next up with boys ice hockey. Uh, they were a team that did not receive as a team scholar athlete, but they did have student athletes that did qualify, and that is something that the State Athletic Association does recognize. So congratulations to those student athletes as well as the team. And they were new, uh, Section 5 quarterfinal finalists. Congratulations to ice hockey. <laughs> Next up 
Next up for indoor track, I'd like to recognize the student athletes that achieved all county recognition, as well as Jake Pasalugo, who was a Section 5 champion and a New York State team qualifier. And as a team, they had a GPA of 91.82. Congratulations. Next up for our indoor track program, I'd like to recognize our student athletes that received postseason recognition and also uh, special recognition to our student athletes that were Section 5 champions and went on to qualify for the states. Zoe Marcus was one of our student athletes, Ari Reebok, and also our 4 by 800 meter relay of Ari, Madison, Hannah, and Zoe. And as a team, they had a 95.11 GPA. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, I'd like to recognize our boys swim and diving team. Uh, you can see the postseason honors for our student athletes, as well as our students that qualified for the state championships. Chris, Matt, Alex, Logan, Jake, and Will. And we also had two first team All Greater Rochester swimmers in Chris and Alex. And as a team, they finished with a GPA of 94.14. <laughs> Next up with wrestling, a special, special season with them. We had numerous all county wrestlers. We had uh, multiple student athletes go to the state championships. Jeffrey Craddock, JT Holman, Trey LaChase. We also had a state champion, um, Brady Unger. In fact, not only was he a state champion, but he was undefeated his senior year. So he never lost a wrestling match this entire year. And if you think about the sport of wrestling, not only do you compete in your dual meets, but in invitationals on Saturdays, you could have as many as three wrestling matches. So just a special, special season for Brady to be undefeated and also be a state champion. And he's the third ever state champion in the history of Fairport Wrestling. Congratulations. I will also add that as a team, they finished with a GPA of 90.32. So congratulations to them. And as we can see uh, from the art awards that we just had, we have multiple students that are very, very talented in many, many areas within our schools, not only in the arts, but athletics. And I'm sure we have many, many others behind me with robotics. So in terms of, of myself, I want to thank the Board of Education and all of our families for supporting athletics. I realize it takes an extremely, extremely dedicated household when you think of when we practice, when we compete, planning meals, and making sure that we have time to do our homework. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have the podium off to the side. Let us know if it's enough off to the side. I'll, I'll move it. Okay. <laughs> and next up for our recognitions is the robotics team. And I think you're going to talk a little bit about their year and have a demonstration. Um, hi, I'm Marie Krause. I'm the head coach of the Fairport robotics team. We have a good number of our, our technology athletes here, I guess we can call them. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is share a video that the students created. Um, it's the impact video. It's about two and a half minutes long, and then we'll talk about our season. Welcome, Welcome to 578. 578. We are Red Raider Robotics from Fairport, New York, and we are fiercely committed to making an impact in our community by expanding the values of STEM and FIRST at work. This year, we began a program that is the cornerstone of our STEM inspiration initiatives. Every month, we design, assemble, and distribute a thousand STEM kits to the third through fifth grades in our district's elementary schools. Students pick the kits up from little STEM libraries and use them to complete hands-on exploratory STEM crafts. From a balloon rocket to beans in a bag, the kits combine to educate youth on a wide range of STEM concepts. We design them using NYS science education standards so that our students learn valuable knowledge from the kits and are inspired to join first. The kids create an interest in STEM careers as well. 
we will soon expand the program to our greater community and to other FRC teams. This summer, we will be running a camp where we'll explore more in-depth STEM projects with youth. The core values of FIRST are universal. 578 spreads them in many ways. We demonstrate our robots for local Boy Scout troops and Odyssey of the Mind teams, as well as at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. We also hold demos for our team sponsors at 1511's Great Pro Red Concert and Fairport Canal Days, where 200,000 community members attend. Across our community service events, we build junk bots for kids using our team's recycled materials to foster an interest in STEM. Our cube mentors three FLL teams, and for the past two years, we've run official FLL tournaments. 578's volunteerism reaches people across our community. We donate items to local women's shelters, senior homes, and refugee families. We also adopt a highway, run Halloween tours with the Seneca Park Zoo, and have recently built and donated cat trees to a local animal shelter. Within FIRST, we foster relationships with other FRC teams by holding phone dart wars and ice cream socials for local teams. We also distribute cases for safety glasses to all dry teams at competitions and design t-shirts for FLR and this year Tech Valley. 578 is redefining how a FIRST team can make an impact. Creating leaders within FIRST, a love for STEM and youth, and improving our community. Our cube pursues its mission in all three dimensions. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm actually going to let uh, my team members do the majority of the talking because they are the best um, ambassadors for this great group of people you see to my left. Um, but I do want to send out a few thank yous, first of all, to the Board of Ed for your continued support and all that we do. All the administrators in our district, um, especially uh, our secondary buildings where we do have uh, robotics programs, if your kids are interested, um, info at firstrobotics.org. Shameless plug, I'm sorry. Um, I would also like to uh, thank the ISC team for their technical support and, of course, the wonderful custodians at Martha Brown who um, just do really great things for us, uh, especially during our build season when we're there three nights a week and all day Saturday. So they do really great things for us. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel, who is a senior. He is actually a seven-year member. He came up from uh, the FLO program at JP, and he is a senior this year. So my heart breaks just a little bit to send him to college. Uh, hello, my name is Daniel Arn, and as I said, I was a senior this year, and I was the team's uh, chief engineer for my second year. So a little bit uh, about our season is we started off with a new uh, team model. So in the past, we've had sub-teams to break down building our robot, but this year we broke it down even more and did cross-functional teams. So what that means is on each team, uh, got a section of the robot to build. Uh, one of ours was our gripper team. And on that, there was people from mechanical, electronics, software, uh, to help speed up the build time and more divide our robot up. Uh, we did this change for two reasons. Uh, the first one is it more modernizes our team, as most of the workplaces that you'd be going into use this type of method. Uh, we did that in th thanks to our mentors. Uh, and the second reason was we hoped that it would help speed up our build time of our robot which I'm pleased to say it did. We had the second fastest build time of our team's history in the 20-something years uh, with only in five weeks, which was very huge for us. Uh, after six weeks, over in Penfield, we uh, went to the Rochester Rally, which Penfield holds each year. Uh, and we had our robot there and did driver practice and broke some stuff. And we had to do some redesigns after that. But uh, we, the redesigns worked. Uh, we went to both of our two competitions with a robot that had no major robot damages or repairs that we had to do. Uh, so now as they bring over the robot, I'll give a little bit of information about it. Uh, the robot's name is Jack-Jack uh, the Gripper. It's a bit of a long story on how that happened. I won't go into it. Jack-Jack the Gripper was responsible for picking up cones and cubes uh, and then placing them on pegs or in uh, little boxes. Uh, 
and we were successfully in the two minutes and 15 second period where our drivers were in control of the robot. Uh, we were successfully able to do six game pieces most matches, uh, unless something major happened. Uh, our drive team, our operator Andrew and our driver Vivian, uh, they both got lots of practice in. Uh, something that we did, we started to do back in 2020, but never got to finish it due to COVID, was we rent or leased a practice space over in East Rochester, along with Penfield, Victor, and Pittsford. And from the end of our build week at week six to our competition in week three, we were pretty much over there every day with the robot getting driver practice in. And we did stuff that we never would have been able to do without it. Uh, so that was huge for us. We also got a team trailer or rented a team trailer this year to go to our competitions. In the past, we've used district operated trucks or the bus that we take to go to our away competition. We've stowed everything underneath. But we decided to rent that this year as a lot of teams have that. And that proved to be amazing because we were able to pack everything up when we wanted to and then unpack it when we wanted to pretty closely. Uh, most of all, we had a lot of fun. And I unfortunately cannot bring you a match video because that's two and a half minutes that we'd have to watch. So well, they, instead of that, I brought you the next best thing, which our drive team is going to drive our robot a little bit. And they're going to pick up the cones and cubes. And then they're going to place them in between the microphones. So if there's space in between the microphones, you might want to shift some stuff. But they have got a lot of practice, and I'll tell you that. So you guys can go. Yeah, I mean, that was on slow speed. You should see it when it's really cranked up. It would make it from there to there in like a second. Um, my name is James Christensen. I'm a junior. Um, I'm the team president of 578. Uh, so I get to represent all of these people, um, face of the team sort of thing. Uh, so our team, uh, stepping back a little bit uh, from our past build season, right now we are a, we're a 12-month team. We do stuff all year round. Uh, we do outreach all the time, and we do our robot during three and a half months of the year. We have 36 team members, 21 mentors, and three coaches. Um, I know I'm very lucky, and I'm very grateful for our mentors. Um, they're all volunteers, and they've really helped me grow as a person. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our team organization and structure outside of build season. So part of our um, our flagship team is a group of leaders that leads the team and helps make tough decisions. Um, so president is part of flagship. Um, I'm the face of the team. And I coordinate um, training between the different disciplines on our team. Um, another, another position is the chief engineer, uh, Daniel. 
Um, he talks to you a couple minutes ago. Um, he manages the building of the robot. He coordinates the whole mechanical aspect during that three-month uh, build season. Um, another uh, position is VP of Outreach. Uh, that's Kaylee, wherever she went. Oh, right there. I'm blind. Okay. Um, Kaylee coordinates our outreach throughout the entire year. Um, she's our link between flagship, uh, where we make decisions and we plan things, and sparketing. Um, where they come up with ideas and help lead the team in implementing them. Uh, we have our treasurer, who is Gabe over here. Um, he takes care of our finances, um, make sure that that all goes well. Uh, we've got FLL coordinator, um, that's Wyatt, who is not able to attend tonight. But he's in charge of coordinating our efforts um, between the FLL teams and our FRC robot team. Uh, we send down all of our students to mentor in the middle schools with FLL teams and make sure that they're learning how to um, code and build robots in an efficient way and really expedite that process as student mentors. And then uh, we also have communications specialist. Um, that's Maya Allen. She wasn't able to attend tonight. She was also part of the art, um, what is it, recogn recognition? Yeah, there we go. I can words, I can words. Um, and the communications specialist makes sure, makes sure that everybody is on the same page and that when we make decisions, that's always being accessed by the rest of the team. And when the team has something to say, um, well, they, they know to come to us and they come to everybody on flagship. Um, uh, oh, sponsors, I wanted to go over that real quick. Um, I had those written down. Um, we're sponsored by Fairport Central School District uh, Xerox, Microsoft, L3 Harris, Thomson Reuters, uh, and PMD, who machines our parts for us. Um, so that's all from me. I'm going to turn it over to Kaylee to talk about some of our outreach efforts throughout the year. Hi, I'm Kaylee. I'm a junior, and this is my third year on the team. Our team values our outreach through our community, and we've been serving them for decades. Our initiatives are things such as Adopt a Highway, Collecting Beth Bethany House Donations, and this year we adopted a f we our, one of our members hosted a Ukrainian family that we helped give items to. One of our off-season projects was making cat trees for the local pet, pet, pet shelter, and we are also doing things for a Baptist home. Our new initiative this year was our STEM kits. STEM kits were for our third through fifth graders that we distributed a thousand every month, and we did a survey on them. That then they said that like the third graders found them too hard, fifth graders found them a little easy. So we're going to next year. We plan on having the third, fourth, and fifth graders separate so that each grade can do their own thing. Yeah, Gabe's passing out STEM kits now, so you can see them. So I, I know we're probably over time, and I apologize for that. But this group of um, kids and adults dedicate a lot of time and effort. Um, and I am so proud of all the work that they do. They walk away um, confident leaders. And that's really important to um, the core values of STEM, that they walk away with experience uh, so that they can be contributing members of society. They're um, elite problem solvers. They are critical thinkers, and they are really impacting the world. Um, I know that the team, like any other team, likes to win. And this year we were recognized um, at both of our tournaments, um, at RIT and at Tech Valley in New York, in uh, Albany, excuse me. Uh, we won a judge's award for our STEM kits and our delivery system. And we won an imagery award um, at the, near, uh, the Tech Valley tournament in Albany, um, and that's for how our robot, our team, um, presents themselves to um, everyone. And these judges' awards are um, highly sought after. Um, they're recognized by some by their peers. Um, these were recognized by the judges, which is a panel of about 20 professionals, professional engineers or pre professional businessmen and women. Um, I, I'm going to wrap it up because I know you guys have a lot of business to do, but um, I can't do what I do without 
my 36 kids, my coaches, and my mentors who just pour their hearts and souls into what we do. And I'd like to publicly recognize them for all their work and thank them. So thank you so much, guys. We will be around for Canal Day, so please stop by and see us there. Um, make some junk bots. And again, shameless plug, March or May 11th is our uh, last fundraiser, our second last fundraiser of the year, Chicken Barbecue, right in the front loop, bus loop at Fairport High School. And if you want a chalk grader for graduation, info at uh, fairportrobotics.org. Thank you so much for all of your support. Okay, within the spirit of keeping our uh, meeting moving, we are going to move uh, on to public comments. Uh, yeah, that'd be great, just so we can see the uh, folks that are addressing us. Uh, so, on, yep, on this slide, you can see just kind of an outline, as we've mentioned many times before. Each speaker will have three minutes. Um, I will announce their name and where they live. We want to make sure that the comments are respectful, not naming specific people, and uh, we will stop if that happens. Additionally, uh, we just also added this uh, for, due to a variety of safety reasons. Uh, so when people are addressing us, if they um, have something to share, uh, a document or a binder or something along those lines, if they could bring it over to our board clerk, Pam Alexander, do you want to wave? <laughs> um, instead of passing it out to each individual ones of us, that would be lovely as well. So uh, with that, we are going to get started. And our first person is Cora, and I think it's Roradan, a second grade student at Brooks Hill. Um, I would ask if you please do not film me while I am making my speech be, um, yeah, because I would not prefer if I was filmed while I am speaking. Yep, you know, I was just going to say give us one second so we don't stream it. Yep, we're going to turn off the camera and then just so the folks in the audience, it's off, so you are good to go. Hello, my name is Cora Riordan, and I am a second grader at Brooklyn.
Cora, I can't wait to vote for you someday. <laughs> um, next, we have Ray uh, Stites, a 10th grade student at the high school. Hello. Um, okay. I was 13 when I joined my first high school sports team. Honestly, I was terrified. I did not know anyone there, and I did not know if I would belong with the group of high ponytails and short shorts that stood before me. As you can tell, I don't exactly fit that description. But then I met my best friend, someone on the girls' team with short hair, is part of the LGBTQ community, and I could see myself in. They made me feel like I belong there, just like when kids of a minority see a character in a book just like them. I saw someone like me, and it made me feel better about where I was. If you care about how kids feel, these characters are crucial, and these representative books need to stay. My name is Ray Stites. I'm 15 years old and a sophomore here at FHS. I run cross country and track, and as seen by my clothes, I just came from practice. I am an honor student, artist, friend, child, and community member. I also use they, them pronouns. As you can see, this is not the only thing about me, but right now, many people in America are defining me merely based on this fact. This is why, as a queer kid, living in America is scary right now. Many states are passing anti-trans bills that will hurt and even kill trans kids. People just like you and me, except these people's voices often go unheard. I am here tonight to share my views on recent book challenges. I don't think the books currently being challenged should be removed from our schools. 41% of banned books in America include LGBTQ plus characters. Other topics include ethnicity, racial inequalities, gender, sexual exploration, and non-traditional family structures. Book challenges target minority groups. We need to understand the experiences of people who are different, but also to see the experiences of people who are similar to us. Taking away books with characters from minority groups doesn't take away from the fact that they exist. The history of minority groups is essential to the diverse community that America is and will always be. If you ask the kids that attend my school who their favorite teachers are, the overwhelming majority of teachers on that list openly support minority groups. Not every student is a person of color, part of the LGBTQ plus community, or part of any other minority group. But the best teachers are those who support their students. And, that is and this is clear proof when seeing teachers who are recognized by students at school events. The students know these teachers better than anyone namelessly judging them for standing by student education. And kids here know what they're talking about and how they feel. People here want what is best for us, but kids, but the kids, but when science shows that these books should not be banned and the kids who are experiencing this agree, why go against it? Because it's child pornography? Frankly, almost every student in this high school has been exposed to and told about that and more. These books are not negatively affecting us. You can hear more profanity and explicit discussion walking through the halls of FHS than reading those books. And trust me when I say that those kids are not learning that from the novels in the school library. I understand that challenging books is a tedious process that involves many people who care about us. It's not quick or easy, and banning a book is not up to the Board of Education, but I am a student and an athlete in the school. I deserve a say in what goes on in my school system, just as every one of my peers does. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge my teammates and their effort of supporting something that we deeply care about. Thank you. Hey. Next, we have uh, Dennis Baer, who resides at Seven Wheatfield Circle. Hi, everybody. Um, just let me know when to start. You can go ahead, and it'll be three minutes, and I'll give you a 30-second warning. Thank you. Parents, guardians, and grandparents, I stand here before you this evening addressing the School Board of Education the superintendent and to inform you that this district has decided to retain a book that I personally challenged. I'm not going to name the book because I don't want to promote it, but the book glorifies drug use and sex amongst high school students that are minors. It portrays the impact of drug dealing students that sway male dealers have over addicted females. It demonstrates how female students may pay for drugs with sex. Each of these people seated before me have received the intent to file notification in full obscene materials, which was ignored by them. Ethical behavior is defined as New York State law as the ability to discriminate between right and wrong and choosing the right path. Ethics involve honesty, professionalism, transparency, integrity, and therefore, adherence to the law is implied. 
According to Columbia University law, public schools have the unique duty and obligation to maintain safe academic environment for their students. In New York State, our public schools are mandated reporters for child abuse. This common law requirement of care places that emphasis on the Fairport Board of Education and the superintendent that oversee policy schools for employees. This, in all of itself, creates a special relationship. This special relationship implies a greater duty of care over children when they are in the custody of a trusted professional. Under a special relationship, parents and guardians trust and rely on the Board of Education, the superintendent, administrators, teachers, coaches, and counselors to protect children while under their care. The special relationship exists because these trained professionals hold themselves out to be educational experts that parents and guardians rely on to make special appropriate right decisions involving children and the law. Their steadfast refusal to adhere to the law and, its re and as it relates to children and obscenity is a misinterpretation of duty of care that is owned here at 30 seconds, especially as mandated reporters for child abuse. This is a breach of duty. Their unwillingness to obey the law and disregard the request for a public moratorium to discuss an obscene materials and the law, which is all we asked for, is a conscious decision to take unethical course of action in the light of New York State Penal Codes. The board, the superintendent, and the administrators in Fairport have ethics issues and absolutely and your, low moral compass. Your time is up. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have Mike Naparowski, who resides at 7 Brimfield Circle. I do not... Okay, I don't see him. So we will move to the next person. Uh, Melissa Muzak, Muzak at 136 Broadmoor Trail. Sorry, let me just get some quick. Ready? I want to stay. Okay, so um, I know that the kind of cool thing that's been happening in the past few meetings has been to read passages from books, so I have a book passage to read for you. He took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Now, I have several other passages, but I'm not going to read all of them. But we all know there's incest, prostitution, rape, and we know where these come from. It's a book that is readily available to borrow at the high school in Minerva, at the very least. But if these types of concepts are discussed in the Bible, why is no one arguing that this book should be banned, too? And there's one very big reason. And did you think I was going to say hypocrisy? That's a topic for another day. No, the reason why no one is talking about the Bible being banned is because of the concept of context. We all know that there is context to the stories of the Bible. Some of us ascribe to them, some of us do not. But we understand that having these ideas available to our students is absolutely normal and necessary. But here's the thing, it's no different for any of the other books that have been mentioned here in these meetings. Pulling out random passages or images from books removes the context from the books, which removes the conversation about their purpose and value. And just because you, as a parent, might not like one particular book and what it has to offer, does not give you the right to make that decision for other students and their parents. You do not get to decide for my child what has value and what does not have value. And I want to 
take a little step aside from my prepared speech because I had a conversation with my kids today. I picked my son up from roller skating. He's in third grade. And my daughter was in the car. She's in first grade. And I told them I was coming to the meeting tonight. And they asked me why. And I explained what I wanted to talk about. And I was doing it in very simple terms. So that made me think. I asked them, do you think that other parents should be able to tell you guys what books are OK to read and what books are not OK to read? And they were like, no. It's common sense to a child. 30 seconds. It's common sense to a child that you have this discussion with your own parents. Other parents don't make it for you. So I urge the board, when listening to community members complain about specific books, remember that those parents have the ability to talk to their children and establish expectations. So that really, the, all this comes down to the parent-child relationship, and that is the bottom line. Have the conversations with your kids about the books. Outline your expectations, but don't presume that you have the right to make the decision for other You're students out and their families. Of time. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Amber Brown at forty-six Nelson Street. So this Saturday, April 22nd, is Earth Day. Many teachers are planning activities to mark the day. This is so important for many reasons, not the least of which is that it empowers students who are experiencing climate anxiety. As with so many things that adults hope to impart to children, modeling behavior tends to have the most impact, and so I wanted to share some things that I've learned recently and invite you and anyone listening to try to incorporate some of these tips into your life. A disclaimer here that once you start diving into this stuff, it can get overwhelming. I'm going to paraphrase Anne-Marie Bonneau and say, we don't need a handful of people doing sustainability perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. So pick what you can work into your life and do your best. And don't forget to challenge yourself when it feels right. Tip one, pick one day each month to mark as Earth Day instead of just one day a year. You could learn more about a specific topic or pick an, up a new habit for the month. Maybe you join the global movement to participate in a plastic free July. Maybe October is all about making your laundry more sustainable with wool lint balls and package-free detergent. Maybe you focus on walking, biking, or even carpooling during May. Tip two, plant something native in your yard or even in a pot on your stoop or balcony. The pollinators will find it. Native plants provide essential nutrition for bees and other pollinating insects, which help our food grow and support birds and mammals. Tip three, learn what can go in your recycling bin. Relatively clean, clean pizza boxes, yes. Clamshell containers like those that berries are sold in are not recycled in Monroe County. I learned recently that any recyclables that are placed in plastic bags will likely be designated as landfill waste at the recycling facility because they just don't have enough staff to open and empty all of the bags and the plastic bags uh, need to be removed or they clog up the machinery. So learn what will be recycled and how it should be put out to the curb because wish cycling just undermines the entire process. Tip four, think about the amount of energy that goes into growing the food that we have available to us. The water, time spent picking, processing, packaging, and transporting. Plan out meals as often as you can so you can make the most of your groceries. Learn what part of the refrigerator to store specific foods in to optimize preservation. For instance, meats on the lowest shelf. Do your best to use up the food you buy and compost the food that you don't get to. Tip five, consider using toilet paper made from recycled paper. I learned recently that boreal forests, which hold on to 1.14 trillion tons of carbon in their soil and biomass, are the primary source, source of virgin fiber used in single-use paper products, including soft, fluffy toilet paper that so many people love. When these forests are harvested, habitat is lost and carbon is released into the atmosphere. A simple act of choosing toilet paper made from recycled paper or bamboo can reduce this. 30 seconds. Tip six, there are a bazillion other tips, so get curious. <laughs> Tip seven, you, yes, you really do make a difference. You don't have to be perfect, but there is always something new to learn. Thank you. And next we have Sarah Nazarian from Nazarian, 131 West Ave. Hi, I wish I was here tonight to talk with you about the important issues in education. But as a high school English teacher for 30 years, I feel compelled to talk about books and specifically the misinformation spread about books in the Fairport District. 
First, an organization trying to ban books in Fairport published a statement claiming that the Pittsford schools recently created, air quotes, uh, actually, those were their quotes, uh, recently created a special task force to investigate book challenges. This simply is not true. Pittsford, like Fairport, has a long-standing protocol in place in case a book is challenged. With recent challenges, Pittsford, like Fairport, simply enacted that protocol. As an English teacher and former department chair, I sat on challenge committees more than once, and the procedures far predate my career. In fact, banning books is one of the oldest methods used by organizations hoping to produce an uneducated population. Second, I took the time to collect from Fairport the data on the books recently challenged and quoted by two speakers at the last school board meeting. Of the five recently challenged books reviewed by the Fairport Committee, three of them have never been checked out of Fairport School Libraries. Let me say that again. They've been checked out by zero students. The other two reviewed books have been checked out by students, one 20 times at Fairport High School and one nine times. So for context, that means 1.4% of Fairport High School students have checked out one book. And those students chose to check that book out. It was not handed to them or assigned for a class. The speakers at the last meeting and in the community uh, emails that go out would have the community believing that the high school hallways are wallpapered with these books pages. Based on real data though, that's not just hyperbole, it's ridiculous. Finally, it's clear that the group dropping their lawsuits on the school board didn't collect this data, or if they did, they chose not to share their findings. Either way, it seems a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars and school resources to sue a district over a book read by somewhere between 0 and 1.4% of the student high school population. Instead, it would be more beneficial for the board, not to mention parents and staff alike, to use time and resources focusing on the real issues facing students today, like school safety and students struggling to get the mental health care that they need. Those are actual issues facing students, not books that happen to be on shelves in their school libraries. And interestingly, the people forcing the district to pay for a legal defense against frivolous, a frivolous lawsuit are the same seconds. people often shouting about budget issues and salaries of certain people they think are too high. So. It's important for the community to hear these facts and stay focused on reality, not a hyped up version of the reality that fits the agenda of a very few people. Instead, let's keep doing the work. Kids need to grow and thrive like robotics and track and all the kids in art we've seen tonight, just like we always have in Fairport. Thank you. Okay, next we have Kevin Glover from Nine Oak Hill Terrace. I'd like to thank the Board of Education for giving me this opportunity to address the community regarding the topic of book challenges in our school libraries. This is also a perfect time for me to thank the board, teachers, administrators, staff, students, and parents for all the energy that they have expended in the last few years to maintain Fairport School's reputation for excellence in such trying times. The topic of banning books has been hotly debated for several years, both nationally and locally. It's appropriate for parents to monitor the materials that their children are reading. Challenging or objectionable materials should be discussed with the student, teachers, librarians, and administrators if necessary. Books that are wholly objectionable should be challenged per established policy and procedures. I'd like to review with you some of the books that have been challenged in the past and some of the reasons why they have been banned. Sun Tzu is reported to have said, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Yet the works of Marx, Engels, Stalin, Mao, and Hitler have been challenged because of their political, religious, or racial ideologies. Many of the works contain hateful ideas that are antithetical to many of the things that we believe. But is it not better to know what or how your opponent thinks? The Bible has been challenged for advancing a, a, a religious ideology. Is that a reason to ban it? If so, 
Is it to be banned in all its iterations, languages, and forms? The Diary of a Wimpy Kid <laughs> was challenged for providing an example of bad behavior to children. No doubt there is bad behavior in the series of a cartoonish, humorous nature. Does bad behavior not happen in the real world? I've seen it, and not just by children. <laughs> Here's one of my favorites. Julian is a Mermaid is a book about a boy who wants to dress up like or be a mermaid. When my daughters were young, boys would come over to play for play dates. You're at 30 seconds. Many times the girls would play Pretty Princess. Some of you have, may be familiar with the game. The objective was to win all the jewelry supplied with the game, including the radiant plastic tiara or crown. The boys always wanted to play. It was dress up. It was fun. Yes, I did win many times. <laughs> No, I did not cheat. I look pretty good wearing that purple wig and crown. John Dos Passos. And your time is up. Okay. I will follow the rules. Next, we have Julie Sadler at 77 Clark's Crossing. Yes. I'm on. Okay, three minutes to shed light. Um, my concerns feel wildly inadequate and entirely overwhelming. Um, I've calmed my nerves by saying, I know these people. These are part of my community. I've met them before. I will meet them again. I can continue to exercise voice. Um, it's not just three minutes. It's an ongoing dialogue and conversation. And um, yeah, so it's the beginning. But what will I say in the first three minutes um, that I'm on public record? I've thought about it a lot. I've spiraled all over the place. And ultimately, I've come up with the conclusion that I just need to ask some more questions. I need more information. Um, and it is under a heavy umbrella. It is under the umbrella, and it's an S word. It's not sex. It's suicide. Um, it's suicide awareness. It's suicide prevention. It is the heavy stuff that is in our um, nightmares. It's in our worries, OK? Um, I get asked all the time, how are my kids? How are the kids in our community? How, how are we doing? I don't know. Um, I know how my kids are, kind of. Um, I am certainly more of an expert on them than I have on anyone else's kids. But I don't know how my kids are doing all the time. I definitely don't know how your kids are doing. I don't know how our community of kids are doing, but I want to know. I believe I can know. I believe you all on the board and the superintendent have access to information to help me answer that question. How are they doing educationally? Of course, that's the primary concern of the school board of education. It is not the only concern. How are they doing as people? How are they doing in their mental health and wellness? How are they doing? Um, you can help me answer that question by giving me more information so that I can guide my next conversation with you all. Um, I went on the website. I tried to get insights as to how are Fairport students faring educationally. I didn't come up with anything very compelling. I saw great schools. I know what it says. I know some of the flaws. I don't like that to be the voice, the information that I'm using to determine how are our collective kids doing educationally. Again, I know how my kids are doing. I know what the New York State reports are saying. I know relative to the broader horizon, but I don't know enough details. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I do know that in 2019, you all collected information about youth risk behaviors. I don't have any more information. I don't think things have gotten better since 2019, but the stats and the information about the suicide attempts in 2019 were alarming about Fairport community school systems. It's scary. It, at the middle school level, 10 to 14 year olds on the rise. More kids were attempting to kill themselves in 2019 than ever took a cigarette, ever took a drink, ever had sex. We have a problem. You can help us answer some of this. Please do so.
And next we have Rich Green at 11 Birch Lane. No, no guitar this time, sorry. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about me, and I'm going to talk about <laughs> Mr. Lamatina, and I'm going to talk about you. And I have three minutes. My name is Rich Green. Uh, I've had the honor and pleasure of serving the Fairport Central School District for 16 years as the principal of Jefferson Avenue School until I retired in July 2020. Before I worked here in Fairport, I was the principal at Keshequa Elementary School in the Dalton Nunday Central School District. And before that, I was a teacher an elementary classroom teacher in the Dansville Central School District. I was a kindergarten, third grade, and fifth grade teacher in Dansville. I took a bit of a circuitous route to become a teacher, though. I mean, I wanted to be a teacher from the time I was in sixth grade when Mr. Lamatina was my teacher at St. Mary's School in East Islip, New York. Mr. Lamatina inspired me in a way no teacher ever had. He was personable, funny, loved the Beatles. He had a passion for history and current events, and he got me interested in those things. He was a musician. He played the drums, and he still does, and he teaches drumming to this very day in the Atlanta area. We keep in touch. Facebook is good in that way. I had the rare opportunity to jam with him a few years back when we both happened to be back on Long Island at the same time. He was there for his 50th high school reunion. I was hosting an annual gathering honoring the memory of my brother Dennis who had passed away in 2002. It's a big jam session featuring musician, friends, and family. We do it every other year on Long Island. What a blast to play with my sixth grade teacher after all that time. We played a Beatles song, of course. I say my route to becoming a teacher was circuitous because I got the urge to become a professional musician while I was studying teaching at Geneseo. I quit school in my junior year and eventually was able to do what I set out to do. I played professionally, full time, for about seven years. Now when the live music scene was starting to take a nosedive in the late 80s, I decided to go back to Geneseo and finish my degree and I started teaching in Dansville in 1992. I of course couldn't help but think about Mr. Lamatino when I started teaching. You see, Mr. Lamatino thought I was funny. He only, not only tolerated my sense of humor, but he encouraged it. No other teacher had ever done that. I was always looked at by my classmates as being kind of strange, but when Mr. Lamatina showed that he accepted me for what I was and actually seemed to like me, other kids did too. I was accepted to a degree I hadn't, to a degree I hadn't been before. I blossomed in sixth grade and my self-confidence soared. And if I ever had any success as a leader, I owe it to the influence of Mr. Lamatina that he had on me as much or more than any other person in my life. And I only had him for one school year. Mr. Lamatina showed me how important it was to honor and nurture the individuality of a child. I tried to carry that forward in my work as a teacher and a principal. A single, caring adult can make a huge difference in a child's life. And a group of caring adults can make even more of an impact on many children. And I want to commend you, the Board of Education, for your dedication and caring and for protecting the individuality of all the children in your charge. Keep up the seconds. good work and keep being like Mr. Lamatina. So thank you for all our to all our speakers. Um, that does conclude our public uh, speaking portion. I did just want to comment. I think Julie brought it up. Yeah, of course. Um, talking for three minutes isn't a lot of time, and we welcome emails um, from anyone that has questions. If we have the answers, we can get them back to you right away. Sometimes it might take a little digging. So um, thanks for getting out here, voicing your thoughts and opinions and we are going to move on we will take a short let's say five minute break because i know some of our uh, students need to get going but i did also want to say if you're a senior i think the dj for the senior bash may be in the room as well <laughs> mr green <laughs> yeah. so make sure you get your tickets if you're planning to go and your request in.
and I'm holding a sack. Okay, thanks. Uh, so now we are moving on to communications. Um, I am not going to talk for a very long time uh, for the president's report. I think that we honored, recognized a lot of our students tonight. I think it kind of speaks for itself. I think some of our student um, speakers up here tonight also were amazing. It was great to hear just a variety of um, suggestions, ideas, opinions, and thoughts. So definitely appreciative of people that came out tonight. Um, there were just a brief thing I wanted to mention, and then I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Provenzano here because I think he is going to highlight a lot of amazing things that I would typically talk about. Um, I did, being on the legislative committee, I was able to meet with uh, Regent Wade Norwood uh, last week, and we talked about um, lots of things that are happening in public education across the state, advocating for funding for uh, mental health, looking at career pathways uh, for students that may or may not be college bound. Um, so just know that Brian and myself and Joyce uh, are at those meetings talking to people that can have um, some say at a higher level. And it was great. He um, is a very passionate man that has been in the field for quite some time. So I just did want to mention that. And I'm actually going to pass it over to the superintendent report. Thank you, our technology team. Appreciate that. Um, we'll see if we could do this. Um, play ball. That was the theme. You know, when uh, our fields were opened, if you go to our um, baseball and softball field, the multi-purpose field. Um, students are actually, I think um, Coach Killian was saying that this is probably the first time in April that he's seen our fields being used, and that's because of the multi-purpose field. Now, that field will serve us throughout the year. Um, it just happens to be baseball and softball season. We're excited to play ball, and man, I'm just overwhelmed. Academic excellence, interscholastic excellence, I believe we could boast about having the most interscholastic sports um, teams in Monroe County. That speaks to our Board of Education's priorities. Um, it's also fitting that we celebrated um, the arts. Could you, like, have you gone to Parrington um, Square Mall? Have you seen the art show in full effect? It is an example of our comprehensive art program. And it showcases all of our students, some of the students that were here tonight, but also our youngest artists. Um, and it's just so inspiring, wonderful, proud to be a part of it. A robotics team was here earlier, powerful. Um, it's not just about science, technology, engineering, art, and math. They're talking about impact, making community impacts, mentoring intergenerational connections, going down to the middle school, to talk about robotics, to get excitement and interest. Entrepreneurship at its finest, we're teaching that, we're investing in it. It's a class, we work here, and uh, the Board of Education makes it a priority. We're talking about the budget tonight, and it's so appropriate that we celebrated robotics, that we celebrated art. And by the way, last night at the Prism concert, breathtaking. I, I think um, um, Peter Forsgren and I almost fainted a couple different times because of it was just exquisite, and it was powerful to see um, the number of performances, um, over 300 performers showcasing their talent. It just doesn't ha this happens every year, right? It, it, it's not by accident. It's an intentional investment to connect kids to something greater. We're proud to be a part of it. The academic excellent pieces with our interscholastic, right? I, I'm not a mathematician. Peter, you're probably better than I. I I'm guessing it was probably like around 92, 93 average, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. <laughs> really proud to be a part of that. Humbling. Um, and as I was saying, it's budget season. And we're showcasing um, just by um, how the calendar is running. We're celebrating all this work. Our Board of Education makes it a priority to tell a story in the budget. The budget speaks to our priorities, prior, priorities, priorities. Priorities is in Webster. <laughs> Priorities is something that you'll see every single day being enacted. 
I'm proud of these goals. I'm proud of the board's commitment, not only to you know, the whole child educational programming, but making sure that our students have state-of-the-art facilities, making sure that we start talking about sustainability. We had a couple public speakers here talking about sustainability and got some really good ideas that we hope that we um, can operationalize as low-hanging fruit. Uh, but they also talk about fiscal responsibility and making sure that we're sustainable through the years, which we'll be talking a little bit about. Um, I have a bright spot, of course, thanks to Lindsay Reddick, that sort of captures the importance of investing in our future ready raiders. The Fairport Central School District puts students first every single day, supporting our future ready raiders and our staff who strive to meet each student's academic and social emotional needs. Your investment in the district allows us to expand our extraordinary programming and uplift the people who make it all possible. The 2022-23 school year started our youngest students off with new programming that is uniquely fair for them. Our Spark Lab opened the door to new possibilities for our elementary students and their active imaginations with science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Optimus says, give yourself moose antlers. It's my, one of my favorite parts of all the school. You could trace those skills throughout a student's journey in Fairport all the way to our acclaimed NASA Hunch class, where students put their heads together to solve real world problems and build prototypes for the National Space Program. The Fairport Education prepares students to be future ready in the classroom and in the world outside our walls. Our care principles, otherwise known as compassion, awareness, respect, and embracing differences come to life during Brotherhood Sisterhood Week. This year, our students sparked their care in their buildings and during the beloved Outreach Day visits. Twinkle, twinkle, all the twinkle, twinkle, star, how I wonder what you are. Our care values are the lens through which corporate staff and students interact with the world and share their light with others. Generosity is everywhere you look raising funds for families in need in our community to walking the walk for Gulf Sinos Children's Hospital. <laughs> our student athletes adopting a cause that is close to their heart or students letting their teachers know they are second to none. And everywhere you look, you'll see staff members dedicating their time and energy to creating welcoming and affirming environments for our students and families. To our Fairport and Parenting community, your investment in our schools makes our mission a reality and creates real value for our students and school community. Thank you for your support this and every year as we continue to develop generations of future ready raisers. We will definitely be placing that on our YouTube channel and, of course, on our social media as we continue to talk about the investment and the, and the rate of return that we see as incredible value for Right here? I'm good. I'm back on. I'll stop playing with it. All right. You know, and we'll be talking more about this when we talk about the instructional budget, but if you take a look at our commitment to high expectations and rigorous and intentional programming, it's here at Fairport. In all of our schools, from the investment in activity periods to spark labs to elementary class sizes to making sure that we have health classes, K-12, um, all throughout the continuum so we can promote healthy um, life choices and wellness. You'll see a mental health team that is geared and wired to support um, their, um, their colleagues and our students and their families. You'll see co-curricular activities, summer curriculum writing, where we can talk about aligning programming, um, enhancing um, our work with literacy, K-12. Um, we're really proud to be a part of it. Take a look on the right-hand side, all those electives. Our students have access to such an enriching experience at Fairport High School, an intentional allocation of resources by our Board of Education. Also, 
highly intentional is the board's commitment to expanding UPK. You'll see 90 total seats for 2023-24 school year. 36, 36 seats will be reserved for income and needs-based students. And there'll be a secondary lottery to fill the remaining seats. We continue to prioritize UPK. We know that it is an investment that will yield great outcomes for our students and our families. And again, um, that is in addition as we continue to expand UPK. You'll be seeing it, um, I think, by the end of this week and into next week. So i um, really excited um, to make that a part of our budget. Really, uh, real community value. Um, we're in a budget process. This does not happen in isolation. You could see right here tonight, I'll be making a recommendation for the board to um, adopt a budget. And May 2nd, there'll be a public hearing. And on May 16th, there'll be a budget vote along with Board of Ed Election Board of Education elections. We need individuals to come out. We um, want individuals to um, share their voice and expectations for our schools. That's on May 16th. Um, another important rock, as I like to call them, one of our big rocks, are facilities planning initiatives. Miner ma uh, merging Minerva Land and FHS and a future capital improvement project. We're gonna be asking on October 12th for community members to come forth in a refer referendum to talk about a capital improvement project. Now, the reason why the Board of Education has made the merger a priority are grounded in research-based best practices. Right? We have declining enrollment 100%. That is correct. We're leveling off. We have consistent and we have an understanding of, of where our enrollments will and graduating classes will be. This year's fifth graders will be the first class to move directly to Fairport High School. If you're a sixth grader, you'll be the final class of ninth graders to attend Minerva DeLand. That has been established, and we look forward to bringing that to fruition. But the reasons why the Board of Education wants to maximize relationships and connections with staff and peers over four years. Our staff is too talented, too engaging to have one year and then have students transition another year. We're excited for our ninth grade teachers to have relationships with students throughout their high school career with, um, with great memories. Reducing the number of transitions over Fairport students' career. We talk about the mental health and wellness of our students. One less transition will make a difference, especially in an adolescent's life. And having access to comprehensive programming, um, not just in one building, but, I mean, excuse me, just in one building. Now there's two different buildings, two different sets of um, sets of um, opportunities. We want to make it one comprehensive um, opportunity for our students. And we want to make sure that we're aligning our curriculum and programming with teachers, staff in the same building. Those conversations will be more fluent and more regular. These are the reasons behind the facilities planning, or the, excuse me, the merger in 2026, 2027. We talk about making sure that our students will come over in 26, 27, and that they go into a facility that is comfortable and modern. If you take a look at our facilities, and we will be holding tours for community members so they can tour our technology spaces and our library and other spaces that need renovation, that speaks for itself on why we need a, um, a capital improvement projects to ensure that there's a modern um, um, environment. This capital improvement project, there'll be no tax impact to residents after the use of capital reserve funds. There will be modern learning environments at the high school to absorb the ninth graders. And we will begin consolidation of district properties with the sale of Balmer Place. Okay. Want to make sure that as we move along, we'll be talking more about the capital improvement project. We'll be talking more about with our staff. Um, on the merger um, on April 28th, conference day, I'll be meeting with um, key staff members, um, teacher leaders, to talk about the merger and some of the questions that they have um, so we could continue to collaborate and move forward together. Um, there was actual user group meeting today, um, I believe, for the science, uh, excuse me, the library, and I believe in the pool, right? talking with those stakeholders, again, getting their input 
um, so we could be informed as we move forward. Um, you'll see in this chart that I have up here, um, the user group meetings in red, um, they're, they're going to be continuing um, as we move into June. And by May 31st, we will confirm the scope and use of the reserves with the Board of Education. So this will be an ongoing conversation uh, in the board. I know um, we'll be using workshops and, of course, business meetings here to have conversations. But there'll be parent and community engagement, more town halls. Um, we plan on doing tours um, towards the end of um, um, our last um, campaign. We brought community members in. I think that was a powerful way to share with them um, um, our compelling why. And we'll be doing that. Um, as we move May, June, and into the summer, and as we start the school year. Um, again, there'll be community, um, excuse me, public comments um, in August, so we're going to have an opportunity for more comments and more opportunities for input from the community, um, and again, public information meetings. I'm really looking forward to switching these microphones. Thanks. Ultimately, I want to say thank you to the Board of Education. Um, thank you for allowing us and giving us the room to be the best we can. We have a strategic plan. There's a QR code. I invite everyone who can scan this QR code to get up close and personal to really see um, where our priorities are and what the Board of, Vacation, Board of Education is committed to. Um, their clarity and focus, um, we see it on full display daily. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Uh, we're going to move on to board comments. So, would anyone like to share briefly <laughs> thoughts? Just want to say uh, a, a public thank you. And we say this every time we have a school visit to our librarians and our library staff. Um, we, we, as a board, we appreciate all you do to make sure our students are represented in the books and the stories that are available to them. So thank you to them. I am just going to mention we had a school tour at uh, Martha Brown. I unfortunately was not able to be there, um, but I just wondered if anyone who was there could briefly comment on that as well. Okay, I'll briefly. Um, Thank you, Martha Brown. Um, the, you know, thank you for the, the wonderful hospitality. We had incredible tour guides who were not shy about taking us around the school, allowing us to go into classrooms. Teachers were so welcoming to us, uh, bringing us right into the class, into the fold, into the conversations. Um, it was just a really exciting atmosphere. And I have to say, as our, our youngest public comment, talking about the cafeteria noise. I think that is a real, that is really something on my mind because I think we, when our kids have these important breaks, you know, I think that is part of their mental health. That is some kids really do need a quieter atmosphere. And it's really wonderful that Martha Brown provides and a lot of these teachers open up their, their school, their doors during lunch times and kids are in the libraries. Um, and you know, let's just, I think it's a great thing to think about is we have a lot of different types of children in our schools and some needed a little a little quieter during those lunch times so um, but again thanks Martha Brown for a great a really great morning so I know Brett mentioned the concert last night it was um, amazing I know most of us were there and it was a great way to see my geez almost all the ensembles in one place for 75 minutes so it was impressive and i was happy it was the first time i was able to go uh due to covid so outstanding okay we will move on are you ready over there <laughs> okay um we're gonna move on to the treasurer and investment update and again, just a reminder that you can see the report down below in the consent calendar if you are looking for the details that Matt will most likely be talking about right now. Great. Thank you and good evening. Uh, tonight we have the Treasury Investment Update for the month of February of 2023. Uh, in the general fund, we had a beginning cash balance of $93.1 Receipts for the month of $3.5 
a disbursement of 11.5 million for an ending cash balance of 85.2 million. Uh, of the 85.2, uh, about 83.1 million invested in a mix of treasury bills, insured cash sweep, CDs, um, about 98% of the total general fund cash. Uh, as we look at prior year and trending, revenues and expenses, uh, very similar to prior year on pace as we um, look throughout the school year, uh, overall revenues at about 106 million and expenses of 74.7 million. The revenues consist mostly of state aid and property tax. Uh, that property tax comes early on in the year. Still have some state aid uh, to come in through the rest of the year, and we'll see those expenses start to get closer to the revenues uh, throughout the rest of the school year. And that is the update for the month of February. Thanks, Matt. Okay, we're going to move on to the consent calendar. Just a reminder that when we do uh, approve this, it's for everything under here. And you can take a look at it if you're home watching or if you want to take a look later. Um, but I do need a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Marty? Second. Joyce, second. All in favor? Aye. So 6 0. Oh. Which brings us to donations. And I know if Brett clicks on it, you can see there's a whole list of things. Uh, we are always grateful to have donations. And you can see here, I think, just one of the highlights, Wegmans, and I think we mentioned it before, did uh, donate lights, I believe. I'm probably not saying the correct term. There's probably a special way to say what kind of lights they are, um, but which will be wonderful to use in any upcoming performances that we have. Um, I know there's often cars that are donated for our auto club. Uh, so you can see there's just a great list here. Also lots of donations for Brotherhood Sisterhood Week. And we need a motion to approve the donations. Brian, Janice, all in favor? Hi, 6-0. Okay, so we're moving on to personnel actions. And up first we have our instructional information. And I need a motion to approve the following instructional staff actions as recommended by the superintendent of schools. Peter, Janice, all in favor? Aye. I see a retirement on there. I think there'll be many um, nostalgic students who had Mr. Bruto, 37 years of, of teaching. What a, what a great story and legacy. Thanks, I was gonna mention that too. Lots of exciting things in there. Um, I'm gonna move on to the non-instructional and civil service. And I need a motion to approve the following non-instructional and civil service staff actions as recommended by the superintendent of schools. Brian, Second. Marty, all in favor? Aye. Keep in mind that um, we talk about these things at workshops. I always like to remind people. So when we do this, it's more of a business so, well, situation. So feel free to join us at the workshops. <laughs> Don't usually have many takers. We're gonna move on to athletics and I need a motion to approve the following athletic staff actions as recommended by the superintendent. Marty, Jan, all in favor? Hi. The next item is um, with Fairport Administrators, the FAA. Um, it's a tentative five-year agreement from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2028. And I need a motion um, that the Board of Education approve the Fairport Administrators Association tentative five-year agreement from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2028. I can't believe I'm saying 2028. <laughs> Brian, Marty, all in favor? Aye. 6 -0. Okay, 
Next up, we have um, a memorandum of agreement with FEA. And I need a motion. Right there. Right there. No, I, I do. do you want to go back? I'd like to congratulate Jacqueline Sauter, Director of Humanities, and I apologize. Thank you for um, sitting here quietly, and we appreciate you and intently, and I think it's a great one for you to come and see the celebrations and the range of community support that we have here. Um, congratulations on um, your recommendation being accepted. Jacqueline Sauter, Director of Humanities. Thank you, Joyce, for reminding me. Thank you, and I apologize. I was actually thinking it was in a different section because oh, there's so many. My fault, <laughs> completely. Congratulations, we're excited to have you with Mr. us. Mr. Bruto, as usual, threw me off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Sorry about that. Um, so back to the memorandum yeah. of agreement Sorry. with FEA. No, you're fine. I need a motion that the Board of Education approve um, the, the memorandums of agreement between the district and the Fairport Educators Association that is attached. Here. Marty, all in favor? Hi. Peter. He hasn't been on there yet, so I know. Uh, next, we are at um, the memorandum of agreement with Basafa. So I need a motion that the Board of Education approve. What? That. Oh, yes, six. Six zero. Moving on, a uh, motion that the board approve the memorandum of agreement between the district and the Fairport Office Professionals Association as attached. Marty, I think Jan, couldn't see you. All in favor? Aye. 6 0. Oh. On to the fun stuff. So I'm going to, yep, we're going to move on to our presentations and we're going to see what's going on with the 2019 Capital Improvement Project. Good evening. Yep, Kevin, thank you from Campus Construction. I apologize. Mike. Thank you. Mike. Um, so here is our March 2023 capital improvement project update. Uh, so just looking at the overall budget for the project, uh, we won't run in through each one of these, but these are the different prime contracts, state contracts, uh, our incidental budget, our construction contingency that make up the overall referendum of 56 million. Uh, so a closer look at the financials based on contractor pay applications. We're approximately 82% complete with the project. Through the month of March, the district has approved just shy of $2.9 million in change orders, leaving us just shy of $550,000 left there. And we currently have $170,000 left in contract allowances. I think that's the first time where we've crossed from contingency what's remaining being higher or less than what's been spent We've, right so looking out for the rest of the project though you feel good that's still sufficient for we feel good yeah we have finally crossed that threshold there um but with where we are wrapping up here at the high school our last major piece is in the gymnasium we've kind of crossed through most of the i'll call it uh trouble areas, potentially trouble areas in 1B, getting through um, JA's parking lot there. Um, we're wrapping up, um, getting close to wrapping up windows over at Minerva Deland. We're inside Dudley and Northside, working on the uh, nurses' offices right now. We're not concerned with running into huge unforeseens at these areas, so right now we feel very good where we are financially. Thank you. Uh, so just an overall look at the 1A project, um, kind of the big pieces of this project. Um, and they are winding down here. Um, we are working on our last set of science classrooms up on the second floor, two biology rooms that we will be wrapping up towards the beginning of May and turning those over. 
Um, and then our next large piece is really in the gymnasium where we'll be refinishing the floor, um, painting the entire space, acoustical ceiling panels will be installed there as well. Um, and that work won't begin until uh, after school is out. Uh, staying at the high school with the finishes project. Um, again, this is wall tile in the corridors, new terrazzo flooring and lockers. Our contractor has been working his way through with the wall tile, um, but the big push is going to be this summer when we get through with the terrazzo flooring on the first and second floor here. Uh, and then over to 1B, um, our contractors have been focusing over at Dudley and Northside, working on both of those nurses' offices. Um, we actually were able to get into JP's tech uh, classroom and complete some of the abatement in there as well. And then they're continuing window replacements at Minerva Deland. Uh, and then our smart schools project, our controls contractor has made his way through um, phase one and we're gearing up to begin phase two here uh, shortly in the spring summertime. Uh, so a closer look at what's going around uh, in the building, starting here at the high school, again continuing with that wall tile installation throughout the corridors. Um, we'll also be looking to wrap up um, corridor ceiling installations. Um, and then up on the second floor in our final classrooms, we'll be looking to complete first coat of paint, ceiling grid, and begin the flooring installations. Um, for the high school finishes project, again, moving around those corridors with the wall tile. And then over at 1B, both Dudley and Northside, um, we're currently in the process of renovating both of those nurses' offices. We started Northside a couple of weeks before, so right now we're looking at wrapping up uh, flooring and then begin installing casework. And then over at Dudley, we're going to be completing all of the MEP rough-ins and then start the drywall finishing process. Uh, so here's a look at the second floor classrooms. Some of the studs going in, you can see. Here's just another shot. Here's some of that drywall work going on. And then you can see more of that along with the HVAC installs. And here's a look up at the second floor, We're getting some of that ceiling grid in. We were able to take advantage of April break. Put that in, uh, hopping over to the 1B. Here's the Dudley nurse office framing. You can start to see this taking shape. And then here's over at JP, the technology classroom after abatement was completed. <laughs> it is a very expansive space in there. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and then here's over at Minerva Deland, kind of a quick snapshot of the, the window install process. And then the top left there is actually one of the photos we had from the previous board meeting. You can see our window contractor was able to get in there and replace that section. It's a very nice clean look. Are there any questions? Thank you, Kevin and team. Appreciate the collaboration and progress. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We are gonna move on to the 2023-24 budget presentation. I just want to say thanks to um, Matt for all the time, effort, and hard work you've been putting in on this, and your team. I know that it's you and others over yeah. at district office. And Brett, I thank no, you too. No, I, no, I, I, <laughs> no, I just know we've been having Matt run all over and answer lots of questions. 
so I think that's part of it's been there's been a, a great effort here um, and there is lots of appreciation to Matt and his team um, and Matt and his team includes Monica Shannon and Chris Eckert um, there's administrators um, including Doug Loff um, and our building principals and directors our deputy superintendent um, really collaborating taking a good look at um, what the community is asking us to do and what the board expects us to do. Um, the board has such clear goals and expectations that it's a can't miss. And we're excited to see it um, come to um, fruition in the narratives that are played out every single day. This budget presentation pretty much has two parts. It tells our story and reflects our priorities. That's the first part of what we're going to be talking about. And then we're going to be talking about how we're going to pay for um, and support um, this story because every story um, requires resources and an intentional allocation of resources. Um, also, it speaks to being fiscally responsive and responsible. As I said, I think it was like in November, the board set these priorities. And so that gives us plenty of time to really have conversations, to reach out to our community. And we've done thought exchanges. We've heard from staff members, union leaders. We hear from community members. Um, we take this information um, and the board synthesizes it um, and helps or confirms um, and reiterates and prioritizes through these very focused goals. Um, that bottom part is so important to maintain a strong financial position. We want to continue to preserve the district st strong bond rating, and we're going to use reserves um, to um, offset costs um, for, um, in our general fund as we move along. And you'll see that um, continually being played out to get back in, to the community. Our enrollment, um, those who have been in Fairport for several years, um, we have seen declining enrollment since the early 2000s. Um, half a percent to a percent. Some years it's been a one and a half, two percent. But we're finally at a place where we're stabilized. We have a consistent um, outlook on what our graduating classes are going to be. They're going to be between 420 and 460 over the next several years. Um, we checked it not just once, not just twice, but three different times. We've done internal projections and we've used statistical forecasting um, who's um, aligned their um, forecast to our internal projections and they're quite consistent and they're being played out. So um, you'll see that that K projection right now is kind of low. That will increase as we move closer. Um, and then through the years, you'll see that st students will come to Fairport schools. And we know that those numbers will increase anywhere, again, between 420 and 440, which helps us with our future planning. We continue to prioritize class sizes in the Fairport Central School District. Um, what we have here are up to um, class sizes for 23, 24. Um, we really work hard uh, on average to keep class sizes um, up to those ranges that are articulated K-6. Um, you'll see um, that sections at the elementary school because of declining enrollment and within our class size parameters um, there are reductions. Um, you'll see uh, minus three um, FTE, full-time equivalents of, of staff um, or sections that will be reduced because of declining enrollment. And we'll be talking about how we're absorbing that and, and using that to reallocate in some other areas. Um, 712, you'll see class sizes um, between 23 and 26 in seventh and eighth grade and 24 and 27. Now, that means sometimes there's class sizes of 17, 18, 21, 22. And there might be an occasional 27, 28. When you're dealing with the master schedule and all the inherent variables, you're going to get those bubbles. Um, but you know those are um, the parameters we're working with, and it's uh, community expectation. Uh, and our students um, seem to flourish in those environments. And you will see um, smaller class sizes in technology classrooms, and sometimes when there's health and safety reasons, like if we're in a mechanic um, area or if we're you know using certain technology, you might see lower class sizes or with capstone, like artists, artists and residents, um, you'll see lower class sizes, but that's, that's specialty. In this budget, really proud again of how we go to the community. I can literally say that 
um, and, and that the board pays attention to the feedback that they asked me to get and we try to make decisions that align with the community's expectations are. The themes this year were, of course, social emotional support for students, making sure that we put it at multiple different places um, throughout our programming. MTSS coordination at the building level. MTSS is multi-tier systems of support that's taking academic, social, emotional, and community resources and aligning them K-12. There needs to be systematic alignment with those components. Special education instructional supports. We have students and we're honored to support those students and serve their needs. Um, we need to provide coaches to some of our classrooms who have students with um, needs that um, require special attention, special strategies, and special skills, and we're um, looking to align resources to that. And you know, of course, we're committed to our code of conduct and restorative practices, um, especially um, alternative programming as a means to support students who need a different approach to school. Um, our board has always made that a priority, and you'll see that throughout the budget. Um, minus um, 4.0 full-time equivalent um, will be not hired back um, because of retirements. Um, I think there was like 17 or 18 retirements, and we will not be um, bringing back four of them. The others will be reallocated. We're looking to add two counselors at the elementary school. Right now they're sharing. You know, it's really hard to share a counselor. It's really hard to share a behavior specialist. And you can see that now instead of having half time at Brooks Hill and half time, um, let's say, at Minerva Deland, um, we are going to get dedicate a behavior specialist on each of our elementary schools within the middle schools and the high school. So we're really thinking that the counselor addition and the behavior specialist addition um, will help concentrate um, the needs that we've seen um, in our schools as we continue to transition back and to support our students in, in our classrooms. Um, we're looking for a 2.2 psychologist, again, to support the range of needs, the, the amount of testing that needs to take place, the amount of services that are needed to support buildings and students. Um, we're looking to add 2.2 FTE for our psychologist and a 2.0 special education teacher um, and one teacher on special assignment to do that modeling, to go into the classrooms, to talk about how do you employ certain um, strategies to support our, our neediest students. And again, we're honored to, um, to, to provide those types of supports. Um, support and administrative, a senior teacher aide to work um, he, actually here at the high school, but to support all of our students who need an alternative approach um, from time to time um, for many different reasons, um, to support um, code of conduct violations, to keep them engaged in our schools um, while we're remediating and teaching um, and modeling um, um, positive behavior with our students. Um, an MTSS administrator, I spoke to who that or what that person's main responsibility would be. That administrator, again, was a community, school community ask of aligning all of our systems, the academic systems, the behavior systems, and the social emotional systems with our community networks. And we have strong community networks. We're proud of our community networks, but aligning them in our system is key. When you have eight different academic buildings, um, and all the different ebbs and flows that occur, um, you need somebody to, to support that process or to oversee that process. So those are the key staffing changes that we've been talking about throughout this budget process. New York State um, Employee Benefits, the retirement system, we have approximately e, um, 500 non-certificated employees. Um, you'll see that their contribution rate as an average of total salary um, went down, or went up, excuse me, about 1.5% from 11.6 to 13.1%. Again, the state sets these rates. We don't. Um, we're obligated to pay these rates. Um, TRS, that's the teacher retirement system. That's our certificated employees. That's our TAs, our administrators, and teachers. Um, that was a slight reduction, right, um, from 10.29 to 9.76. Again, the state generates these numbers. Um, and we really don't have a good idea on what that formula looks or how they ascertain that, but it's tied to the economy and indicators um, at the state level. And of course, the employee benefits, um, cost of doing business, right? Um, people need quality 
um, health and dental insurance, um, workman, workman's compensation, and other benefits, like a med, life insurance, unemployment, all those things that organizations have. And I think that's what sometimes we forget. We're a real live organization, and we have responsibilities. And you'll see throughout each one of these budget lines, this employee benefit um, consistent and stable. So I won't be doing this throughout every single employee line. But the first part of um, our budget um, is the programming piece that we just spent a lot of time talking about. I'm not going to go over it again. We've talked at length about it. This is our story. This is what our students remember. This is how our students engage. These are the community expectations, the electives, um, the spark labs, the activity periods, uh, modern learning environments, um, all wrapped up into this program budget. Now, you'll see that the program budget has, um, I'm not going to go over every line, but I'll go over a couple. Like where you see special programs, you'll see 8.44% um, increase. So that's our ELL, our special ed, our OCK ed programming. That's our EMCC. EMCC is our partnership with BOCES where we have anywhere from 70 to 80 students each year who go into BOCES programming. We have students who go to private placements and a range of special ed programs. Um, costs have increased there. Um, and you'll see a 45% increase in the summer school line. That looks like a big um, bump. Um, but we just sh shifted some salaries from grants to the general fund. Um, the way that we're supposed to manage the grants changed, and Matt and his team, forever on the ball, um, you know, had to make those those shifts. And um, we appreciate the attention to that detail. The library, media, and computer instruction, that's 8.12%. Software licenses, and you know, we get many of our software from BOCES, right? And administrative costs have increased. You'll see salary adjustments. We have technology people from, from ISC, are, 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 um, where we house um, our tech coaches. Um, they support instruction. You'll see they're part of that line item as well. Pupil services, um, you just saw staffing increases um, from psychologists, to behavior specialists, to counselors all come from pupil services where you see a 9.65% increase. You'll see clubs there in student services. Our athletics um, investments are in that line. Uh, again, the 9.65% 9, 9 increase speaks to all those. Transportation, our board has made it a priority to make sure, and they've, and they've made it clear that we need to make sure that we uh, recruit and retain um, the best drivers because they transport our most precious com um, commodity, and that's our students. Um, and wages have um, forced that line item to, competitive wages have forced that line to increase, and the board has happily adjusted that. Um, you'll see this transfer to special aid fund. That's our summer school and our UPK, right? Um, that's up 68%, but the UP UPK piece is right there. So we talked about UPK. Um, the board sees that, again, as an investment and a rate of return that you get students in sooner. You get them in there sooner. They get acclimated. You engage with families. And we're really excited to continue to see that program grow. And overall, in that program budget, it's 4.62%. The administrative part, this is the second part. It's 11% of our budget. Right? Um, it's costs associated with the administration of the district. You'll see um, the Board of Education, there's a line that says 10.14%. Well, that's because there's meetings, right? And there's costs associated with voting and polls and paying those who come and support and work at the polls. Um, the board does not get paid, right? Um, the amount of time that they put in, the amount of meetings that they put in, um, you know, that's, that's their time. Um, but those are the line items associated with that, including the board clerk. I mean, there has been an increase in meetings, and there's the cost associated with it. Um, you'll see um, that there is a 7.3% increase in other central services. That's our BOCES services, our network administration, our Wi-Fi. Um, you'll see, um, you know, pick my kid up, school tool, parent square, all those things cost, right? And we're using more 
software more than ever, and um, services and fees have gone up, and that's where you're ref that's where that's reflecting um, that number of 7.3 percent. I skipped one: um, legal, personnel, public information, is, um, and services. Um, high levels of printing needs that we have here. You see that we're putting out um, multiple publications a year. Um, there's legal costs. Um, we're seeing campaigns for recruitment and retention of staff. I'm really proud that we're prioritizing that because we want to um, do a good job of making sure that we bring the best um, here for our students and community. Um, again, that line item is at a 9.65%. You'll see a minus 42%. That's always good to see, right? And that's because um, our commitment to BOCES, many of our students, I said it earlier, I said, I'll, I'll quiz you, that number was between 70 and what? 80 students use our BOCES, at EMCC programming. Um, they've had major renovations. We've had to commit to paying over the past three years um, um, up to a million dollars a year. And um, that, that payment is no longer there. So that's why you see a decrease in, in um, that line item. And that's why overall, you'll see, again, uh, minus 3.7% in this line item, the instructional administrative support. That's where that MTSS coordinator is. Um, and I just, again, thought that would be important to highlight some of those for the administrative budget. It's always impressive. Our schools, you know, we just show up here every single day, but they're used constantly. It's really inspiring, and I sit here amazed every single time I come here on a Saturday or on a Tuesday night, and the amount of activity that's just not happening at the high school, but in all of our schools, it's breathtaking, right? Um, 12 buildings, 300 acres, 31,000 square feet of buildings to clean. 31,000 square feet of buildings to clean. Um, it's just, it, it, it's a cost center, right? And we happily have to commit to that, and you'll see that and the operations, maintenance, and security. Hey, security, more than ever, that's a community expectations, right? Um, and we have a top-notch security um, leader in Sam Farina. Um, he has a team. We have centuries, centuries and guardians of all of our schools. Now, thanks to the Board of Education's commitment to make sure that we have individuals there to make connections, another individual there to make connection, that's all on that 5.15%. You'll see bus purchases. You know, the cost of buses have increased significantly. Matt, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you told me today and I lost it. $30,000 $30, more, right? And we're, we're willing, and we have a replacement cycle, um, you know, based upon, uh, you know, best practices. Um, we're replacing nine buses, but that's going to be a 23% increase, which I think Matt will be talking about that on the other side of um, how we'll be looking to get revenue from that. On the other side, um, we have debt service from our 2019 capital improvement project. You'll see a 623, uh, um, excuse me, a 500, excuse me, 562 percent increase of our debt service. Now, that's from 2019, right? And Mr. Stevens is going to be talking a little bit about that. But that debt's coming on. We're obligated to pay it, and we have a strategy to to move that forward. And then we have uh, internal transfer fund, that's current debt from previous capital improvement projects that we have to pay, um, obligated to pay, the community has um, invested in our schools and you know, you'll know, you see that that's the inner fund transfer. And in that line item, again, it's uh, I believe 11% of our overall budget, 14% of our overall budget um, is 18.32% of an increase. Total expenditures, our program administrative and capital, is 5.31%. When you put all those together, um, thank you for bearing with me as I went through those details. I kind of like it, you know. I can't really get up here and talk and you guys not talk back at me, but I'm sure, no, I'm joking. Um, now, I think a very important part of this is Mr. Stevens um, is going to come up and talk a little bit about how we're going to support um, our expenditures with revenues. I love, you know what, we've worked hard on that pie chart. That's eight years in the making, that pie chart. Relevancy for me is the key. He's going to correct my square footage of our buildings. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. It's a little different than 31,000. It's about 1.2 million square feet of buildings that we have as a district. So um, 
just wanted to highlight that piece as you know as our custodial maintenance staff <laughs> um, so thank you very much uh, tonight I'll be going over the revenue portion of the budget in terms of how do we support the expense side so here you know just visually a little pie graph here showing uh, the different revenue sources we have the two biggest pieces excuse me being state aid and our property tax uh, revenue we receive so that's that makes up the majority uh, of the revenue side of the budget, close to 90, uh, a little over 90%. And then other pieces, sales tax, that's a huge piece. Monroe County shares sales tax with Monroe County school districts. That's um, very beneficial for us. There's other counties in the state that do not share sales tax. This is a nice, um, a, a very good piece and we appreciate that. So it's about $6 million of the budget on the revenue side. Um, we have other revenue from uh, commissions to facility use, uh, tuition, all those different pieces that would flow into the um, other revenues, and then Medicaid, uh, and then our assigned fund balance or appropriated fund balance, and our assigned uh, reserves, as well as debt service fund. So those last three I mentioned, those are, uh, two of those are, or one is reserves, that's money in our savings that we're assigning to uh, help offset the revenue side of the budget. Uh, the assigned fund balance would be monies left over from the current school year budget in 2022-23 that we're giving back next year to manage the tax levy increase as a whole. And then the debt service fund transfer, uh, that is utilizing money that's in our debt service fund. Uh, it's meant and required to be used to offset and pay a portion of the local share of debt, um, the long-term debt that we have uh, in our in our budget for the projects that have been previously approved in our long-term debt. So those pieces, uh, that piece is very important and it can only be used for that sense. So here's a, um, you know, an, an outline here of the state aid revenue. So foundation aid, that is our largest uh, piece of non-restricted operating aid that we receive as school districts. Here you'll see as part of the uh, three-year phase in to fully fund the foundation aid formula, uh, we have our last year of the uh, large increase to get us fully funded, um, according to the formula, of about $4.1 million or 15%. So that's huge if you remember the years past. Um, the formula has not been funded uh, to its, uh, the, according to legislation, fully. And there's been a commitment over the past three years to get that up to the fully funded amount. There will be, uh, I received the question earlier today, uh, we'll be getting back pay for previous years. No, they're not giving us back pay for what they did not pay us uh, in the previous years. Um, this gets us up to the point in terms of where uh, we should be based on many different factors of the formula from enrollment to, um, uh, to poverty level, et cetera, all the different pieces that flow into the foundation aid formula. And just really quick, Matt, if I can, kudos to all past members of the legislative committee who for years advocated in Albany at the state level to, have, to get us fully funded. And it was a long, long, long fight and we are there, so we are grateful for that. The next piece um, is our um, expense-based aids, excuse me, transportation, BOCES, and building aid. Here you see um, a slight increase, uh, but on the back end behind the scenes, really what you would see is you'd see a reduction in BOCES aid because that's related to the BOCES capital improvement project. Expense that dropped off, we received aid on that. Um, but because that's going to be paid for and there is no expense next year, that drops off the budget. And then there's an increase in building aid. And that increase in building aid helps support the oncoming debt for the 2019 capital improvement project. So just as planned um, in terms of the impact as utilizing the capital building reserve to support the project and lower the overall borrowing long-term for the district, the building aid offsets a portion of that local share. And then, um, flows into the tax cap exclusion formula as a whole. So utilizing the building aid to support the debt increase on the expense side of the budget. Then excess cost aids, those are aids received for um, private and public placements for, related to special ed um, education, whether it's at a BOCES program in district or at a uh, private placement outside the district. We receive aid back on uh, those expenses and services. And then the last piece is aidable materials, urban suburban and tuition aid. And here you see a slight decrease. That's primarily because of our um, enrollments over the years. The aidable materials for textbook, software, library materials and hardware is based on an enrollment figure. So 
that's why we've seen that decrease over the years. Overall, though, um, about a $4.2 million increase in state aid. Again, that foundation aid really being that strong piece for us. And then the back end, the building aid um, as well, supporting the revenues. So I thought I'd do, a, before we jump into the calculation, just a brief review of the um, tax, property tax levy limit. Here's the language uh, enacted back in 2011. Um, this has been the uh, 2% uh, known formula. However, it's not always 2% in terms of what districts can go out um, or what their tax cap would be for any given year. There are exclusions to the formula, such as um, debt, capital purchases, such as buses. Um, uh, if the pension system increases or higher than 2% from a percentage point, we're able to exclude anything greater than that times the eligible salaries. So those are a couple of different pieces. Sometimes it can fall below 2% for school districts, depending on the growth in um, CPI, um, as well as any falling off exclusions districts may have. Here is a look at the formula for Fairport for 2023-24. So you start with the prior year levy, and I'm not gonna read through each line, but there are um, a couple of main pieces here, exemption in prior year related to the capital exclusion of 1.2 million. And then you see towards the end of the um, chart, the capital levy for the current year being 23-24. So slight increase there um, up to about 1.7 million. That's related to primarily to the local share of the 2019 capital project. And also built into this is the reduction that we saw related to the BOCES capital improvement project. So that's why we see this. There's a couple different pieces that flow through the formula. Um, overall, after the exclusions and calculation, it leaves us at a 2.98% um, property tax levy limit, meaning that the district, um, they levy a tax to 2.98% and still be at the simple majority vote related to the budget approval. Here's just a historical look at the budget tax levy and rate. Um, just overall looking at the chart to give you an idea, you see the budget piece um, increase over the past couple of years. That's also been linked to the foundation aid and increases we've received there and the different programs that we've continued to support as a district um, and the debt service payments coming on as well as um, adjustments and wages and all the different pieces that Mr. Provenzano talked about on the expense side. The tax levy increase in green, you can see slightly is slightly above the tax rate increase percentage over the years. Uh, in 23-24, because we're utilizing the 2022-23 assessment base until that becomes final in the summer, uh, right now they're projected at the same increase percentage of 2.98. However, you can see historically that the rate increase, once the tax base is set, the tax base grows, then that has an inverse relationship on the growth of the um, tax rate itself. So uh, we would expect uh, with a growth in tax base that the rate increase would actually fall underneath the 2.98%. Then just to look at what does that mean in terms of the tax rate projection, and again here using the assessments from 22-23, uh, you can see the rate projection of $24.24 uh, per thousand dollars of assessed value. That translates to a 4,848 um, cost for a $200,000 home. That's without STAR, so if there's basic STAR or enhanced STAR, you'd reduce those numbers out of that. If you were getting the payment directly from the state, then you wouldn't reduce it out of there because your payment's coming from the state. It's still offsetting overall um, on that piece. So again, you see a 2.98% increase there with the growth in tax base. Again, we'd expect that to be less overall. The other, um, tying all the revenues together here with the property tax and the state aid, uh, you can see again, the two main increases, um, two large pieces of the revenue being the state aid and the property tax levy accounting for about six and a half million dollars of the overall $7.6 million increase. We are seeing an increase in the sales tax revenue um, as well as an increase in the transfer from the debt service fund. That increase in the transfer of the debt service fund, that's related to a premium that we received on a short-term borrowing for a bond anticipation note of about $500,000, plus utilizing the debt service fund to, um, as required to give back, to 
offset the uh, debt for 2023-24. So overall increase um, in the revenue, about 7.6 million or 5.31%. That supports the expense side of the budget. Matt, I just wanted to point out that it has shifted a little from last time you presented. Yep. Um, I think we were committed to trying to get it um, below where it was originally, and you, you worked hard to make that happen. Do you, was it, I'm going to say, was it 3.97? Uh, 3.68% is where we were in the last presentation. Again, part of any process in the budget planning is um, looking at the short-term debt and long-term debt that we have and managing the principal right. payments um, that are coming due as a whole. So with the debt service fund and the principal payment management, we're able to get that to a 2.98% increase. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that it is lower than we had originally anticipated. Mm -hmm for people that may have questioned it before. And then I also just wanted to say that I'm pretty sure we're in line with um, our surrounding school districts as well. So it's not just us. Yep, and it, and it truly can vary by school district because yeah. in one year a school district may have capital project yep. debt coming due um, or being new, whereas other districts may not. So that calculation doesn't, there's different growth factors within tax bases in different school districts. Um, there was a year dating back to 1920 when the tax base was, um, there was reassessment in the town of Parrington and our growth of tax base was uh, over 2%, I believe, which now we're at 0.48% for 2023, 24. So yeah. it can vary, the formula really can vary between districts, but yep, in line, yep, the sound of surrounding areas. As well. I know people ask about it, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, great point. Um, the fund balance and reserves that are used to balance the budget, and I touched on them a little bit earlier, uh, the assigned fund balance, again, that's money left over from the 22-23 school year that's being projected to uh, offset the revenue side. And then debt service fund, our tax tertiary reserve and unemployment reserve, those are two reserves that we may utilize to um, pay for operating expenses related to those different pieces. Um, and then the retirement contribution reserve, it's a combination of the employer retirement system and the teacher retirement system expenses that we have. So budgeting 2.2 million to come from uh, those different reserves for a total of 7.2 million um, between all of those. Main reason you see the increase is the debt service fund. So, you know, that's a piece that, you know, as we look through and we manage each year, um, something to keep in mind that we are, you know, we have in our, our audit and finance committee, we talk about these pieces and have long range planning for those, but um, not an actual assignment of a reserve, more of a fund for expenses that are related to the debt. And then this is just kind of shows how it goes through. So the, the budget itself, we start with $151.7 million. And the revenues of 144 and a half, those are the revenues other than the transfers from reserve and the assigned fund balance. And then we add those other two pieces in to show how it is a balanced budget uh, with the revenues, fund balance and debt service fund um, and reserve transfers. Here, the reserves as a percent of budget, a slight decrease. It's something we're always keeping in mind, you know, how much we're relying on from the reserves and the assigned fund balance to support the budget. And you know, long range as we look at this piece, um, naturally there'll be a slight decrease if it's staying the same with a budget increase. However, always good to, to manage that, especially the assigned fund balance. That's another piece that we look at as well. So next I'll let Mr. Provenzano jump in and take us home, take us home with the dates. As, as I've said frequently, this is a process. Um, it's April 18th. Um, we'll be recommending the budget that we just presented. On May 2nd, there'll be a public hearing on the 2023-24 budget. And on May 16th, we invite residents, community members who are eligible to vote um, to come to Joanna Perrin Middle School from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, to um, participate, to have their voices heard. There'll be three open seats. Um, I think um, we have three candidates running. Um, and we'll make sure that we continue to communicate um, the details of this very important date, and we'll continue to talk about the invest in, investment in our schools and the value that it creates um, for our community, and most importantly, our students. Again, that important date is May 16th at Joanna Parent from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. 
can't help Sorry. yourself. Obviously. No, I can't. No, and just to, just to add to that, I know on the first slide or the first or second slide when we look at the agenda, um, there's a, a item that says um, other voter propositions if applicable, and it left it there purposely. This year in 23-24, the only piece that we have on the budget on the ballot will be the budget vote. As a whole, we've seen reserve approvals in the past, um, but this year just the budget as well as the board elections. So I just want to highlight that. Um, as a whole as we're so we're not asking for people to access tech reserves or any other capital reserve or to create a capital reserve like we've done in the past this will just be the budget correct thank you important point any questions matt i have one quick one and i apologize if, if you answered this and i missed it uh the payment coming due on 2019 the the debt service is that a one year one time thing is that going to be a recurring thing in the next couple of years that we're going to have to prepare for and handle or how does that that repayment work so it's a good question so at the beginning of any capital project we go out for short-term debt until um, we're able to start to receive building aid on capital projects um, this is really the and then we're required to make minimum principal payments on that as well as line that up with our building aid um, over the fifth over the long term portion of debt. This is the beginning of the payments really coming due and having the payments over that 15 year basis. Um, as presented back in 2019 when we went through the capital project proposition. So um, this is the the beginning of that phase in of the debt as a whole related to that to the 2019 project. Yep. So we're getting to a point where we're going to start we're closing out projects. Um, as Mr. Um, Arlotta mentioned earlier, as we're going through phase 1A and 1B of the capital project, with those finishing up, we're able to submit final cost reports to the state and start receiving our building aid. So, so to answer your question, it'll be ongoing. Ongoing. Yep. And then what happens is that will fall off eventually as we move forward. And that's how you time it up with other. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to board discussion action items. And first on the list is the 2023-24 school budget, which is what we just looked at. And I'm assuming since there are no questions, I would need a motion to, oh, sure. I was going to say, as was presented tonight, okay. so I was going to say I need a motion to approve the 2023-24 school budget in the amount of $151,722,000 and $2, <laughs> as presented in detail. <laughs> Peter, Brian, all in favor? 6-0. And we're. Can I get a point of order, please? I don't know. Mr. Gu Mr. Gu Mr. Gubernati, I'd be happy to talk with you, as I always am after, but not in the middle of the board visit. So, Mr. Gubiati, we could develop that. Um, there's been multiple opportunities to interact, to come, to ask questions, to send emails. We talk all the time, and we'll be happy to follow up with you. I don't mean to interrupt the board in the middle of their business in public. So, And I will just say that this is not the first time we've talked about this. We have had numerous workshops, numerous meetings, looking at pretty much every line item. So... Respect, respectfully, Mr. Gubiati. Well, yeah, but, we, but we, we'll, we'll, again, happy to entertain that question as we have done in the past. Um, we're always open to that conversation, but. Yeah. So if that's a conversation getting around it right now, tell me what it is, and I'll shut up. 
Okay, so we are going to move to the property tax report card. So I need a motion to approve the 2023-24 property tax card as attached. Uh, Brian and Peter, um, all in favor? Aye. Six zero. Oh. Okay, we um, have been working hard again with our policy committee, so you can see that we are have a number that would be a first read. So I need a motion that the Board of Education approves the first reading of the following policies. 3281, 5410, 5630, uh, 3222, 7520, and 7521. And again, this has been looked at numerous times as well, and everyone has had an opportunity to um, ask questions. So I need a motion. Uh, Joyce and Jan, all in favor? Aye. 6 0. It's not, they're not all available. Is there a reason? I mean, uh, should we approve the ones that aren't available for? Seventy-five twenty-one. All right. I'm just checking the next ones. Yep. So we would approve it as. The ones that are attached. Should I read them again? No. Okay. We also have second reads. Um, so I need a motion that the Board of Education approves the second reading of the following policies 3130, 32-21, 32-71, 32-90, 74-50, 81-30, and 34-20. Marty, Joyce, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Six, zero. I was just checking. I think they're all there. Next, we have the Audit and Finance Committee Charter, which if you're home, you can click on that and see it as well. Um, so I need a motion that the Board of Education adopts the Audit and Finance Committee Charter as attached. So moved. Peter, Marty, all in favor? Aye. The internal audit report. I need a motion that the Board of Education approve, accepts the internal audit report and approves the correction action plan as attached. Again, a lot of time has gone into this as well. Brian. Second. Peter, all in favor? Can we make comment? Yeah, Sorry, it's fun. before we vote, sure. Uh, just if you don't mind. No, you're I, fine. I always like to make it one because of how good they are. Right, the audits come back clean, so clean, and so it has in that corrective action plan, which I think sends a wrong message, <laughs> by the way. Right, um, I appreciate all the hard work that our finance team does that gets such clean audits with you know little findings next to zero. Uh, the error rate if we, we calculated for I calculated for fun. I shouldn't say we calculated for fun. Well, it's like three hundredths of a percent. Right, well, with intolerance of engineering or other things, I believe, um, in terms of the findings and just the natural challenge of the uh, calculations associated with stack submissions, um, I think that was admirable. So thank you to the team. Peter, much more impressive math than the math I did earlier. <laughs> I'm a geek. But. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Um, so all in favor? I six zero. Next on the agenda, um, and I think this is something we do once a year. Um, Monroe Bosey's one also has a board, and we um, participate in approving folks that are on that board. So that is what we're going to do next. It's the Monroe Bosey's one annual election and administrative 
uh, budget vote. So, Erica? Yeah. Sorry, just on this, uh, I was wondering if I could motion to vote on, uh, consider all three seats at once rather than have to read all three individually. I Are believe you have to read them individually. We've 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 um, okay. We've crossed that bridge in the past, and we were advised motion because I, I remember that motion withdrawn. <laughs> I, I think it's a great idea, by the way. <laughs> I just <laughs> I know. I think Pam actually asked when it came in, and we, we had the same discussion. Yeah, I think we have to officially do all three. So here we go. Okay, so I need a motion that the Fairport School Board of Education cast one vote for the election of Amy West. Resident of Honeyway Falls, Lima Central School District, is a member of the Monroe One BOCES Board for the term of office, which will begin July 1st, 2023, and end on June 30th, 2026. Joyce? Brian? All in favor? Aye. Seat number two, a uh, motion that the Fairport School Board of Education cast one vote for the election of Lisa Layton, resident of Penfield Central School District, as member of the Monroe One BOCES Board for the term of office, which begins July 1st, 2023, and ends on June 30th, 2026. Marty and Joyce. All in favor? Aye. And seat three, motion that the Fairport School Board of Education casts a vote uh, for the election of Rebecca Hicks, resident of East Rochester Union Free School District as a member of the Monroe One BOCES Board for a term of office, which will begin on July 1st, 2023 and end on June 30th, 2026. Marty, Jan, all in favor? Aye. Six zero. I just want to note that you can see that they do have people from um, all the neighboring um, districts, so they don't have people, let's say like three, that would be in Fairport, so they try to divvy up where they're from, so it's representative of all the school districts. And in addition to the seats, we also need um, to vote on their budget. So a motion that the Board of Education of Fairport Central School District votes to approve the proposed Monroe One BOCES administrative budget in the amount of, wow, my eyes are hurting me, um, $5,701,066 for the 2023-24 fiscal year. Erica, can I make a quick comment? Um, we had the opportunity to visit BOCES a few weeks ago as part of our district visits and the services offered, uh, career tax, uh, BOCES needs, uh, special needs students, and the teachers and the staff that work there. It is just, it was an inspiring visit. Yeah. It was such a wonderful time and so great to see and such a great investment for students in our community who want slash need those services. No, I agree. And I think a lot of times people think just special education when they hear the term BOCES, but just like you mentioned, there's a lot more that they offer um, just two individual schools and right there on site as well. So, thanks. <laughs> so, um, Brian, Peter, all in favor? Aye. Six, zero. And now, we need a motion to enter into executive session for matters related to recommendations for tenure. Um, and we do invite um, into the executive session the superintendent and the assistant superintendent, Doug Loff. And just for people that might be listening, I think there's seven people right now, uh, we won't be coming back with more content or information. We will uh, re-enter and then adjourn the meeting. So no need to stay tuned. Brian, 